bit of a backdrop. We're going to wait just maybe two or three minutes for all of our um, visitors and guests to come in. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping and a little bit of just perspective, um, certainly from myself and co-founder of Future Proofing Next, Andrea's point of view. We are all things innovation, transformation, and trying to bring your future forward. Um, we are hosting this forum. Really, we actually have a lot of fun doing it, so that's one of the reasons everybody should have fun doing whatever they want to do. But we love hosting discussion forums of people that are actually doing innovation, um, kind of as and Andrea says, in the wild. Uh, and so we've brought two of them here today to tell us how they're doing it inside their two companies. Um, so we're going to tackle the who, we're going to tackle the why, we're going to tackle the how uh, in terms of leading innovation. And certainly use some of the details down below in terms of if you catch something that you like, um, certainly leading innovation and future proofing now are, are two different hashtags. I'm going to set up our warm up poll question. We always ask a question off the top and this one is what's been the biggest change in innovation leadership in your organization? We've got five different choices and I don't know if we want to put a time purview on this, but let's say, you know, how have things changed over the last five years in your organization? So hopefully your chance to engage, we're all about interaction here. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll spend a minute or two actually uh, rolling through that poll. And I always have a challenge on this, trying to get the poll off. I have not yet mastered Zoom, but uh, uh, at some point we will answer that question shortly. A couple of things to uh, keep in mind before we officially get started on this webcast. Um, I'm excited uh, just because I am spending literally the hours of 12 o'clock at night to four in the morning minting what are the 52 business models of the future. So we'll be unveiling those September 24th. So if you're into pivoting your business to a different arena uh, and hopefully looking at what are the most promising aspects of that, um, that'll be something to schedule in. Um, myself and Andrea, despite this publishing world's craziness of nobody reading books anymore, we are publishing uh, another book. And so we'll be launching that on October 22nd. Uh, we'll be, uh, it's kind of not a book book. So it's much more of a practitioner's uh, playbook. And so if you're interested, um, certainly we'll probably tease out some um, incentives, uh, probably a book uh, or two on October 22nd. And this is the working cover and working everything, but uh, there's been a ton of research. We've taken a novel approach to the actual writing of a book and the content inside of it. And hopefully it can function as somebody like you who are a change agent in the world at large, trying to figure out how to do innovation in a somewhat larger company than 50 people. We also have a guild. You know, most uh, medieval companies and organizations had a guild. We want to have a guild too. And so we've got something called Future Proofing 66. If you're interested in joining us, we've got a number of interesting research projects on the go and collaborations. Um, certainly give us a shout and there is a link down below if you're interested in being part of our illustrious 66. And uh, I'll tease out just a bit of content here. Uh, we think innovation is kind of, we think the word has a lot of baggage. And so even though a lot of people recognize this is the world that we play in, we think it's a much broader world. We've kind of identified the 30 things that you really have to have a handle on to master um, kind of innovation and you can go online to our website and look at next 30 and see what 30 those things are. All right. Uh, that was housekeeping. Let's get into today's webinar. I'll, uh, I guess I will, uh, give the good courtesy of introducing my co-founder as well as co-host of this webinar, Andrea Cates. Unmute yourself, Andrea, and say hi to everybody. I'm unmuted and hi everyone. Great to be on uh, webinar number six. Excellent. Yeah, it's crazy how uh, these things have ticked up. Uh, we're treating it much like Netflix. This is our first season, but uh, we think we will re-up for a second and third. So, um, As well, Joanne is managing our NASA dashboard in the background. She's uh, kind of our Geppetto, kind of pulling all the great strings that we need. And uh, it's great because we've had some tech snafus beforehand, and it seems like we've solved them. So if you see a man in a boardroom trying to figure things out, uh, he is one of our special guests uh, chiming in from Copenhagen, and we'll introduce them shortly. And these are the two. I mean, uh, Natasha Longo will do the small introduction now. We'll do the more formal one in a minute. But um, Natasha is the SVP of Marketing and Brand for CX Loyalty. Uh, it is a large, large company. It seems like you keep acquiring different companies, so I'm, I'm losing track of how, how big you guys have become. Um, she's chiming in uh, from Boston today. And Ashok Kalyan Zwami, 
and I said I was going to do that right. Hopefully, I got close. Um, all right, good. Hands up. Uh, he is the CIO globally of Saxo Bank in Copenhagen, a really forward-thinking uh, financial institution that uh, I know Andrea had um, some time to spend with uh, recently, and we're so glad to have him on our show today. So we'll introduce uh, Ashok uh, in a short time as well. I thought myself and Andrew could do the quick tennis match back and forth. I thought um, no better way than to introduce a uh, webinar webcast on innovation than invoking Steve Jobs' name. Uh, what do you think, Andrew? Innovation distinguishes between the leader and the follower? Well, it's always amazing how the, uh, the themes of our webcasts uh, mirror the themes of our lives. So just yesterday, as it turns out, we had a session with a group from Toyota Industries Corporation, came down from Tokyo to Silicon Valley. And it was a group of people in what used to be called IT. And one of the things that was interesting about information technology was the insight that they were chosen as future leaders. So they were in Silicon Valley to, to learn about uh, leadership. And what was interesting is that, you know, even in Japanese to English, where there were some um, translational issues with the, with the language, it was very interesting that the, that the core of what we came to was, it's not enough in IT to have like trouble tickets. It's not enough to be responsive. It's not enough to be obedient to requests. Because now, even roles that used to be, you know, when we would take, say, cost center or profit center, it's not that distinction anymore. Now everyone has to be responsible for looking at data and deciding how to be a leader around that data, how to be proactive. And so yesterday we realized that you know the role of IT has changed completely and that these are emerging leaders that can't be can't afford to be managers anymore because the data that they have access to is too damned important. Hmm. Interesting. And recent as well, very fresh. Just, just yesterday, so, yesterday, hot off the press. Yeah, really I think, inspiring. I think we will tackle it with it, uh, with the who gets to lead innovation. I think there is a real strident debate in terms of, you know, is there a function that delivers it? Is it everybody's role? It sounds like in your situation, it's everybody's role. Um, um, it's funny, I did a lot of transformation work a couple of years ago and, and getting to this question of who gets to lead innovation um, we know the world isn't flat uh, and has many different facets and dimensions to it. It may, in fact, and I'll tease this out for argument, because um, we do have some research results we'll share. Um, there may be a choice for either a CEO, um, some type of uh, function, uh, or maybe a specialist to actually do your innovation, depending on the situation that you end up in. Uh, I know Natasha comes from the customer world. I'm, I'm, she's probably going very lower right on us right now. And uh, I know Ashok comes from the technology world. He's probably upper right. Any thoughts in terms of the, the leadership stuff before we ask our special panelists and guests, Andrea? Well, well once again, at the, at the risk of uh, sounding like we're, we're going to be uh, ruining the book that's coming out, you know, spoiler alert. One of the things that we think, I think Sean and I think is really important is that, that unfortunately, innovation has been given to, quote, creatives for a really long time. You know, design thinking came in and people with, one guy at Lego said, you know, the people with the berets from Milan would come in and be allowed to be innovative. And then there was a fight, you know, this ambidextrous thing, you know, we have to have creatives and uh, analytical. What we're seeing is that without all four domains, you really can't move an organization forward. We're all about corporate innovation. And so to us, the, the, the punchline of all of this is that data, insights around customers, logistics, research, the ability to say what we've talked about uh, yesterday, we were talking and we were um, last week, we were with the Copenhagen Business School students and, you know, ears to the ground, uh, a foot in the future, a hand on the wrist and a lot of data coming in all around it. It's four quadrants that's really required now. And I think, thank God, innovation has finally come of age. So it's not just, <laughs> no, no offense to people from Milan, but you know, the people with berets from Milan coming in and being creative. And all of a sudden, my investment in black turtlenecks is not uh, turning out to what it should be, right? No. You could, you uh, could trade them in. You could trade <laughs> them in. <laughs> uh, looks like I'm going backward here. So let's go forward. Um, so a quick, because it's interesting, I find this question of who gets to lead innovation. This question has been torn asunder within the startup world. There are legions and legions of different types of research that say, 
who makes the best startup founders? Who has built billion dollar unicorns? So uh, this is kind of, um, there was somebody that did, a, uh, this person, Ali Tamazep, if I'm saying that correctly, did a really good um, kind of database to understanding of where the best startup founders come from. I would love to know where the equivalent of that is in a corporate innovation sphere, because I think maybe it's a little bit tougher to get the information, but I think it would be extraordinarily helpful to figure out based on type of company, what type of innovation person you've you know, decided to put in charge of that function or decided to make a, a CEO. And a quick follow-up to that is, you know, let's, let's make sure, because I know you, Sean, have a, a perspective on this as well. It all depends on how you define innovation, right? So if you're Very defining true. innovation the way we were just saying a moment ago, um, you know, you'll, you'll end up with people from design schools. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's one element. So I think that the conversation we're having today is mission critical for uh, the four of us to be really thinking about today's version of innovation and what's really required in today's market. Agreed. Uh, at the risk of putting more lingo out into the universe, certainly, you know, there are different styles of leaders within startups. Uh, I'm wondering if we codify and, and other people have already different types of styles of innovation leader that uh, might exist. I found this one interesting too, like what are the traits of innovation leaders? And somebody, I think this was uh, Peter Thiel had done um, kind of a really good job looking at what startup founders do. And he, he said it's almost a reverse parabola, parabola in terms of just what the traits that great startup founders have. They tend to be on the two different poles here, which... Uh, I guess introduces two notions from a corporate innovation standpoint. Are corporate innovation leaders much different than the average person that may work in your company? Point one. And two, um, do they have defining traits that make them so different and so talented and perhaps so uh, distinct from the peers that they sit beside? And uh, I also think this is an interesting because some of those characteristics may not be fully positive. Um, some of them may require them to be a little bit the valence might be negative just for them to succeed in whatever ambition that they're pursuing. And then finally, I, I would love, we've got the two right uh, special guests on our um, webcast today because we, uh, Forrester recently looked at the question, what are the actions that firms are trying to take to deliver better innovation? So this is the actual process of delivering it. Um, you know, I'm a former CMO, Natasha, I'm not liking our trend here. We've, uh, we've fallen on a second place behind investing in emerging technology. So there does seem to be these, this two tribes going to war. Are we customer focused? Are we tech focused when we look at uh, innovation? And I have a quick question that Hong Chao has we'll asked. cover that off today. Oh, I don't know if you can hear, but uh, we just have a, a really relevant question. I won't answer it now, but I'll throw it out there, which is a question we'll talk about. Is there innovation in consumer market, innovation in business management and ops, and innovation that's more around design thinking in the center of innovation. And I think that's a great question. And we'll use that with your permission to kind of frame some of the conversation that comes in a moment. Yeah, it's great. And I think it goes at the heart of like, uh, we're going to try to avoid answering these questions with it depends because that doesn't lead to productive conversation, but uh, there certainly is, you know, what's your ambition, what's your style choice, all of those different considerations. And then the last setup for our entire discussion today, I thought um, it's interesting when you look at startups and if you look at most of the headlines that you'll read on Fortune or, you know, any of the, the blogs uh, that you might look at, uh, we really do worship and glorify startup founders. And so you might think, well, we want all of our innovation leaders to act like startup founders. And certainly from Deloitte's standpoint, there are five or six key differences that startups do that corporates either fail to do well or perhaps are not set up to do well and therefore putting a leader in place that maybe is over anxious and takes too much risk and is way too um, transparent in their decision making might not make sense for some of the things that um, corporates have to figure out. So uh, I know uh, I love Andrea's term of being a rational optimist. I think the tenor and tone of today's discussion, I love John Maxwell's quote here, pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist complains or thinks it's going to change and the leader adjusts its sales. So we'll do that for this discussion. And uh, Joanne has popped up the research and we don't have full quorum, but it looks like more people are focusing in on their strategic portfolio of opportunities versus any of the other four considerations coming up versus five years ago. So um, interesting. Um, I guess we'll, we'll have that as maybe part of our discussion um, as we roll forth. Any other top line thoughts, Andrew, before we get started? 
No, I think this is perfect timing because as we enter, you know, this notion of Q4 and we know that 2020 is coming. So everyone will start to do the strategic corporate planning around 2020, you know, this notion of perfect vision. I think it's really important for us to come clean about what innovation really needs to be in today's market and who gets to lead that. Wonderful. All right. Enough talking about uh, with us. Uh, people can talk to us a ton of different times. We're going to have a couple of different guests. We're, uh, and like a hockey person, we're going to treat this like uh, a hockey game with three periods. Um, so if I can roll forward on this, I'm going backwards. One second, guys. I think when I popped it back up again. Okay, I think we're going the right direction. Um, we're going to talk a little bit of uh, implications to, on innovation around the CMO and customers and CX loyalty. Um, we have Natasha Longo here. Um, she has had a long and storied career, not only within global marketing functions at CX loyalty, but a wealth of different companies, a wealth of different functions across the gamut. So oftentimes as a former CMO, I used to get pigeonholed as, oh, you're just the marketing guy. Well, uh, no, Natasha's done a ton of different things within um, not only CX Loyalty, but a lot of other blue chip companies. Uh, last time we checked, CX Loyalty is three to 5,000 people. So certainly within the category, you'll probably check me on the numbers, but certainly within the category of this is not a startup. Uh, things operate differently when you get that many people operating across that many geographies. Um, I love uh, her qualitative note here in terms of thrives on doing what others think are as impossible. I thought that was uh, worthy enough to be noted within your bio here because uh, I expect you to deliver your A game given that kind of statement today. <laughs> and then she's also a board member of Namaste Sober and loves organizations that create you know, positive social change. So welcome. Welcome to our little club, uh, Natasha. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. All right, let's get right into it. Our leaders, our leaders born. Oh, first of all, we'll ask a donut hole question, which is, what is the biggest new trait required of a 2020 leader? And uh, we'll answer it on the back end of our little discussion here. So uh, we won't bias our audience here. We'll uh, we'll wait for uh, we'll wait for them to answer it. But if uh, if people can answer that poll, that'd be great. And then on to what we want to talk about. Oh, once again, I'm going. Let's see if we'll fix this. Uh, as I'm trying to figure out the slide work here, Natasha, um, are leaders born? Uh, do we create leaders? Like, let's go very basic level here. How do we? I think it's a little bit of both. So oh, tomorrow. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. So if we even look at that poll, I think we're missing one word in there. I think it's grit. Um, I think resilience is one and then grit is another. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed across, you know, the spectrum of people that I tend to be more attracted to from a business perspective is the people who have the most grit and we have a lot of similar backgrounds, um, similar experiences in life. Um, we've had to figure things out or make things work that may, you know, have been from a challenging past and, you know, we've taken those forward. So it's definitely been uh, an an area that I think is it, it's undervalued because it's not something that you can necessarily put on a resume. Um, it's it's just something that you develop over time. And then natural curiosity too. That's another piece. You know, I'm always asking. I'm like a two year old. I'm like, why, why, why? You know, why do we do things this way? Why do yeah. we think about things this way? You know, what if we did it differently? What does that look like? How could we do it differently? So those are those are a couple of things that you know. I think you have an inquisitive can-do attitude. That's definitely there, um, but definitely natural curiosity for everything. And that started really young before I was well into business and well into sales and client-facing roles, for sure. I love the idea of grit. Now, I, uh, at the risk of creating a pecking order of innovation professionals, um, I find, you know, I've used the term that corporate innovation is kind of like the major leagues of innovation. Like you can do startup innovation, but that's kind of like something more minor league because all you have to do is convince the marketplace and maybe some funders of your vision. In a organization of your size, you have to not only convince the marketplace, you also have to convince your own company that it's right, right? Right. And then that comes back to like 
creating a groundswell, starting with a small group of people and learning how to tell a story and then get people to believe in that. So it's more of a grassroots effort and then learning the ropes of the different areas of the business where you can have a conversation with different groups of people and say, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? Give me your thoughts, give me your feedback and really just get a lot of buy-in from from other people in the, in the organization and then have that groundswell kind of expand and expand and then start to pull people into it so that it becomes more like community thinking but it definitely starts small yep um and and maybe we've we've got at our first question here we're going to try to get through about eight or nine questions in our mini interview here um i know it's a setup question but i'll ask it anyway is there one type of successful innovation leader can there be like just something that we mint from heaven that comes down and says this? No, no, I don't think so. I wish that would be so much easier because then we could uh, have that clarity. I don't think there's any one type of anything. Um, I think it's really about, you know, the chemistry. That's definitely a big part of it within an organization and understanding the types of skill sets and personality types that you have um, that you're working with. But no, I don't think there's one type necessarily. It's definitely a combination of a lot of those traits that you showed in the previous poll. And then, you know, working with other people who also think like that, that are willing to be collaborative and share ideas. And, you know, it's not about really um, judging each other's ideas, but really just thinking about like, where's the white space, you know, what can we come up with, you know, what's viable, how can we create a proof of concept and that type of thinking. So no, I don't think so. Roundabout way of answering you, but I don't think there's one type. <laughs> no, I, I figured you'd answer it that way, but maybe the bridge to the second question is, is there a type of leader within uh, your current company, CX Loyalty, that you go, wow, this type of uh, leadership approach really works well with CX Loyalty and an alternative school maybe equally valid in another place, probably would work less well in CX loyalty. Any thoughts on that one? So um, I, I can actually just speak to something that we, as an example, something that we did recently. So I just went through with my team, a full scale company rebrand, and we were supposed to do this, you know, I think industry average is like 12 to 18 months. It usually takes by the time you get through a full audit process and, and get everything done. And, you know, having C CMO experience, you know how complicated that can be. But, um, you know, going through that experience and I had a really, really supportive CEO who I was just like this with all the time. The focus was very much on, okay, how do we make the organization better? How do we, you know, bring clarity to the brand and that type of thing. So, um, I think when you have an innovative or an innovative thinker or someone who at the top line, especially with the CEO, CFO, the C-suite, they're open to new ideas and they're open to hear you out, even if they may or may not agree with you, but they want to hear everything from the beginning until the end. And you have an opportunity to constantly feel comfortable that you can go and pitch your idea or pitch white space ideas that people haven't really talked about um, to your leadership and you feel very comfortable about that and it's an open invitation, um, but for real, not just sort of something that's yeah. said, um, you are in much better position to actually have those conversations and feel like that leadership team wants you to succeed and you can lead because you're being given the opportunity to do it. So for us, and, and I can say, I don't really love the term best practices because I feel like it's almost an oxymoron. Best practices like be like everybody else and innovation <laughs> is new things that are not like everybody else. So um, our, I think, philosophy collectively is to just go out and talk about ideas and bring things up and try to figure out if we can poke holes in things quickly, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't. Hopefully that answers the question. No, I, I think it does. And I love you reframing best practices because, uh, yeah, it seems like every single one of these webinars we get, I think last webinar was like, uh, we're not about mitigating risk here. We're about learning. Uh, right. And so, yeah, right. uh, delicately reframing the question. So here's like an interesting one. And we do have some research that I'll share in a minute. But uh, who gets to lead innovation? And I guess if, the, if we've got a CIO on today, he's obviously responsible for Saxo Bank's um, technology. We have CMOs. Uh, you've been a CMO. Um, they are in charge of marketing and communications. You've got a CFO who's, who's in charge of finance. Innovation. 
Like, it seems like this uh, has an orphanless parent. Like, uh, should we have a chief innovation officer? Sometimes I know chief digital officer has become something um, fashionable to actually have in your company. Or is that really an obstacle to really it's on the CEO's desk and he should be the innovation lead? Well, I guess it depends on the organization, but for for my, I can speak specifically for mine and, and I've never had a problem um, bringing up ideas and, you know, suggesting things because I'm just naturally curious and I want to bring new ideas or think about what's going on in the white space uh, all the time. I'm doing that constantly, not just when I'm working, but from an organizational perspective, who gets to lead? I think the onus is on everyone. So from an organizational perspective at the C level, everyone, you know, you're not in your, your little silo of finance in your little silo of information or technology. All of that stuff is inextricably linked. Your, your success as an organization depends on how well you're working together as a team and as a group. And I don't mean like the saccharine version of collaboration necessarily. That word I feel like is overused, but, yep. um, your CTO might have a great idea for something. Um, within our organization, there are people in this, at the C-level as well as you know, the SVP level who have a ton of cross background experience. Like me, for example, I've been in enterprise sales for 10 years. I was in client services. Um, I've, I've been in an operations role. I worked in a call center. I've been in four different verticals. So it gave me the opportunity to understand how to communicate with those people at the C-level and specifically within my own company, just to talk about like understanding and having empathy for what is bugging them. And then we have those innovation conversations once the guard is down for sure. But it's, it's absolutely everybody's responsibility. Yeah. It's an interesting pedigree you have there too, just as a, a metaphor for what innovation leaders will look like, whether that's a CEO or whoever we define that as the most accountable leader. Just, you know, this tension of, oh, they're outside of our field. They must know something different versus no, they're inside. They understand what we're all about and therefore we identify and have some affinity and let them innovate uh, well, right? So yeah, absolutely. Um, I, had, I had four options here sorry it was the ceo maybe somebody in the executive suite that isn't the ceo uh, this chief innovation officer or it's everybody's business which seems to be a very popular answer to this question and for a moment for a moment i will take the other side and say no i don't think it is everybody's business because quite frankly you ask somebody to host a party um most people it'll be collective irresponsibility and everybody will want the party but nobody's being able to curate it because that's really really tough stuff and if I look at the interest in chief innovation officer as a term, and I think there's something like 500% more chief innovation officers over the last decade that have been hired, there is some market-based substance for actually going, yeah, we probably, if our company is big enough, need to anoint somebody that at least um, helps us along, if not is the accountable leader for innovation. Um, and certainly in our research, 60% believe innovation is the CEO's role. So I've just disputed my own kind of support for chief innovation officer by my own research, but any thoughts in terms of the specialist role of innovation? So I absolutely think the CEO is the steward of the business. So, you know, ultimately it will roll up to that person, whoever they are, but um, you know, you, you can almost think of it like an intrapreneurship, you know, there, there's like a, a, a mindset of a person who might be a specialist and is focused or a department that's focused on innovation. And there's an opportunity within an organization to create a business case um, that actually, you know, not only does it tie to what we're trying to do moving forward, but, you know, how does it tie back to the brand strategy and the organizational focus? And does it fit within, you know, the mission, vision, and values of the company? So, I can definitely see where there would be a space for that. Um, having someone in that specialty role, I think where you, you run into challenges maybe, or I'm not even sure it's necessarily a challenge, is what defines that role of who would be the person who would lead the innovation? So yeah. they would have to be pretty strong in understanding you know, how to build a solid business case, um, you know, understanding how it fits into the technology architecture, which is something I'm sure Ashok can talk a little bit more to. And then, you know, how does that roll up and integrate into the overall brand vision, mission, and values? So, yeah, I, I definitely think there could be a place for it, but the skill set could be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. 
at so many different levels. I mean, I was going to use a sports metaphor, but then alienate half my audience here. So I'll just, <laughs> we'll do, we'll do a quick rapid fire here and then we'll move on to our second period of discussion here. Um, like more of the DNA of the actual leader himself uh, or herself. Um, you know, what are some of the background dynamics? Um, how do you rank? You know, like we, we at future proofing next have like these, this lens of like the five things that you really need to get right in terms of the world at large. You know, are there, you know, are you even brave enough to rank the parts of the innovation leader DNA here? And maybe some of the key traits that innovation leaders live by. Um, any thoughts on those, those three? So I think what's interesting is how we've become such a consumer to business focus, you know, just the way that the market is. So, you know, what has worked really well, at least for me, so I can speak for myself and, the, and my experience so far has been really getting to know, you know, the out, its orientation is external first, right? So marketplace and customer understanding what the challenges are. And as far as innovation, figuring out how to meet a need and then solve for that need in a way that, you know, is differentiated. So I would definitely say the outside first. I, and that's just from the experience of having been in, in the sales and client services environment. I find building that relationship and the trust gets people to open up and talk about what's keeping them up at night, what's stressing them out from a business perspective, what challenges they're having. And then, you know, as far as the rest, I, I guess it depends on the culture of your organization, but if you stay with an outside in focus and you're focused on clients, I feel like a lot of it trickles down and works itself out. And then uh, my piece around customer versus technology, I think we had led with a piece of information. It sounds like, I'm going to put it out there. If you don't have a good command of technology, you're probably not going to be good at innovation, correct or not? Oh, I don't know. Stru I think you have to understand it. Like I'm conversant in it. When I have a conversation, I understand kind of the architecture, functional architecture. I don't understand it to the level that someone in a technology team necessarily does, but enough to get by for sure. Um, and the struggles that folks have when they buy a ton of technology, but then they don't, they're not really sure how to use everything. And that, that kind of, challenge seems to come up on a regular basis, at least in my world. Um, yep. So, you know, strategy and organization seems to be the, the bigger focus, more so than the technology. We have three just quick uh, pieces of research that we've done in our corporate innovation playbook. So we went out to the world at large and asked questions. I'd love to get your reaction to these and see, um, see if you agree, disagree, or which side of the fence you're on. We looked at the backgrounds of innovation leaders. You know, what attributes does your innovation leader currently exhibit and like where are they from originally, pretty much? Um, and it was an absolute even split. I don't know, I think that's the first question we've ever actually been proverbially yeah. sitting on the fence. They looked at people that really understood a domain or an industry well versus having some general business acumen. You got a side of the fence that you're on here? Well, if you get enough industry specific domain expertise in enough verticals, you're good. But um, otherwise, I would agree with the overall general business acumen. It goes to, I think, your history of just having worn a lot of professional hairnets in your past yeah. and being able to look at things. Traits of an innovation leader, we said, okay, so is this a measured approach where you should be the smart follower or is this a pioneer approach? You really need to be first to market on the stuff. Uh, I might have been on the other side of the fence on this one, but certainly our panel spoke and said, yeah, we're pointing more toward appreciating a leader that can actually be that pioneering first person. Got a thought on this one? Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Pioneering approach is definitely there, but then in the corporate world, you still have to have that measured approach and smart following to maintain, you know, the business in general while you're also doing those pioneering things. So yeah, I'm with you. I think this may have been driven by kind of startup culture and just like, yes, we all need to be in that thing that maybe fails magically, right? But you can't do that in corporate sphere. And then final uh, question before we pass it on to uh, the second period. Um, should you be focused on a new market or audience or should you be focused on a new product or service? Um, unfortunately for us marketers, uh, more people said, yeah, we really should be focused on getting our product and service right versus you know, finding it and then tuning it to a new market. Thoughts yeah. on this one? Yeah, I would say new market and audience development because I think that's where the most opportunity is for white space and, and meeting a new need that isn't being met versus product and service development, because I, I tend to find that with product and service development, it, it 
I mean, depending on what it is, um, you can pigeonhole yourself too easily. So yeah, I think I'd go with the first one. All right. Well, hang around. We will we'll be back for the third period. We're going to take a period off. We're, uh, we're going to handle, hand it over to Andrea here. And uh, I guess, Andrea, you get like the donut hole question that we have here and you can yeah. go from here. So thanks. And that was really a great tee up, Natasha and Sean, because uh, we'll, we'll be uh, violently agreeing and also sort of doing some yes and or yes but ands, I believe, with, uh, with Ashok in a minute. But I think it's really interesting to hear the notion of grit that Natasha talked about. And of course, we all know the Angela's at Duckworth book on grit, um, because here we have the people on uh, who are on the webcast today, looking at an equal split, you know, action focus agility is one of the biggest traits required, like biggest new traits, uh, resilience, biggest new trait, and also comfort with ambiguity. And the ability sometimes to execute runs completely counter to all three of those traits. So unfortunately, you know, we're going to talk in a minute about how you do both, you know, and we, we don't talk about ambidextrous organizations. We talk about multidextrous. So the, uh, it seems like we've got, we've got our work cut out for us, Ashok. So l let me uh, go to the next slide and, and talk a little bit about um, who our next period two person is. And by the way, is that a hockey thing, Sean? That's, I believe, Saxo Banks' uh, head office. So um, no, 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 I don't mean that. I mean the the periods. <laughs> oh yeah, no, totally the hockey thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've, I've been to Saxo Bank. So let me uh, go to the, the next slide and, and introduce someone who I discovered in Copenhagen. I mean, I didn't discover him. For me, I discovered in Copenhagen during the Copenhagen FinTech Week, and we got to go on a lot of different field trips. And one of the most surprising field trips was I walked into a building that we just saw in Copenhagen and there was the pretty much the coolest virtual reality, virtual environment uh, demo I had seen. I thought it was fiction, it turned out it was real. So I realized that somehow, some way, some great innovation was happening. And then when I learned about the business model, it, um, I got into a really deep and rich set of conversations with our next participant in this webcast. So Ashok Kalanswamy is the Chief Information Officer at Saxo Bank and incredible background in terms of what used to be the quote non-innovative world, right? So investment, understanding technology, looking at data and information technology solutions from that that very uh, analytical side, maybe not even invited into the room when the guys from Milan walked in to talk about, you know, um, design thinking. However, in the past few years, it's been really clear that people like Ashok have come forward as absolutely mission critical to any innovation thinking. So I'd like to introduce Ashok and, and we'll get into the notion of what it looks like from your lens to, to look at innovation. So I think, um, I'm, I'm sorry, so welcome Ashok. Hi, thank you, Nita. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, it's, it's great to hear from you and, uh, and have some of the, uh, the Copenhagen spirit. We, we are a little bit sensitive to Denmark these days, having just um, had some political <laughs> moments with your country. So uh, with Denmark. Yep. Well aware, well aware. <laughs> yeah. So um, the first thing I think everybody should know is what is Saxo Bank? Because once again, I walked in and was pretty blown, up, blown away by everything in your corporate headquarters and in your model. So just for background, could you... Tell us a little bit about Saxo Bank's innovative model, because just your entire mission and, and, uh, and reason for being is extremely innovative. So could you tell us what Saxo Bank really does? Sure. And uh, the word bank is very misleading. Yes, we are a bank, but Saxo Bank is a facilitator. And really what we mean by that, our business model is like Uber or Airbnb, uh, where we are a facilitator to democratize trading and investment. So let me, uh, let me take that and go back for a minute, right? I, we work for a founder-led company. This is not your traditional corporate. I work for Tim Fournay, the co-founder, who founded this company with uh, 70,000 euros and doing um, effect broking over the phone. And then it became a technology internet-based trading company. And really, if you talk about disruptive innovation and corporate innovation. Uh, way before Uber and Airbnb, these models became familiar. We, we uh, Kim started this business uh, as a facilitator model. So what, what does that mean in simple terms is um, that we 
give access to global capital markets to anyone. That's the word democratize. So the reason for this, when Kim used to work at a corner bank and he just found that the banks were out to get people with fees and this and that, and they were in it for themselves. So he, beg- he started Factor Bank with the purpose is to make markets uh, uh, easily accessible to everyone. Mm-hmm. So at the other end, we have professional traders and investors who want to access global liquidity and markets. So in, in the case of Uber, you're trying to uh, get your liquidity is taxis and cars. For us, for traders and investors, the liquidity is all financial instruments, equities, bonds, features, effects, and so on and so forth. And we don't have direct connectivity to the markets. We get a liquidity from JP Morgan or, uh, or uh, Goldman Sachs, whatever, the other big banks on the street uh, globally. Um, but at a very low cost, uh, a, lo- a very low cost of entry, there will be lower the barrier of entry. And you can trade 88 markets around the globe, many hundreds and thousands of instruments, really from your mobile or desktop. So that's the core of, of a business model is being a facilitator. And because of that, uh, what Kim uh, always alludes uh, to us as, we are a tech company with a banking license. Because in really, in order to facilitate all of this, there really should be or actually very little human involvement in all of this. And you really use technology for people um, wherever they are to access global markets. So technology is a key, plays a key role to this. And because of the way uh, our business model has evolved, uh, what we also do, there's another class of customers where we act our uh, wholesale uh, partners, where we white label our product. So what does that mean? So for example, Banca Generali is a big customer and I can be 120 plus white label customers. So where people, like for example, if you have a company or a bank which is offering local products in Italy or Portugal, but suddenly want to give their customers, right, access to global trading and investment, for them to get all the banking licenses and build the infrastructure is going to, you know, take multi years and multi million dollars. So they just white label us, and so they could just take a front end and just put the, their logo on it, or a front end, a decouple from a from a core uh, back end using open APIs. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit technical, but they could use a whole back end and access it. So right? Yeah. So, so yeah. So what so I'll that's do, the core part. So I'll jump in just because once again I warned uh, Sean and Natasha that you and I could easily easily have a ninety minute conversation just the two of us. So we'll we'll leave them wanting a little more today. Um, it it is an unbelievably in, innovative business model itself, which I think speaks to what Natasha was just speaking about. You know, the need for gravitas and the need to bring innovation to scale is completely embodied in your business model. So I have a question. Unlike some large companies that are sort of strapped with a history of, you know, how in the heck are we ever going to innovate because we've got this 100-year business model we can't undo, you've actually got a different challenge, in my opinion, which is you've got an innovative business model. This notion of democratizing trading and investment and giving access to, you know, to these global capital markets is, is really big. So I have a question very specifically, you know, about how you have, while you're trying to keep that plate spinning on the pole, right? Meanwhile, you have these very interesting new initiatives. Like I mentioned, I don't know if this is the one you want to talk about, but the Saxo virtual environment that, that started to um, develop and, and, and uh, develop legs and, and, uh, and, and scale while you were already in the midst of your, uh, your first innovative model. So my question is, in an innovative model, right, where you've already disrupted something, how do you have a new initiative take, take wing? Right. And that boils down to culture and people. I think I, I see uh, out here Hong alluding to some of this. I think if you, if, in the founder-led organization, um, our whole culture is there's an element of psychological safety where people want to uh, have an idea uh, they can try it out, come to leadership, uh, and do many different things. In this particular case, uh, while, we are, uh, while we are trying to go to new markets or build new products, and uh, as Natasha was saying, that's always there. There was this, there was this person, Tim, 
who said, look, I'm really passionate about virtual reality. This was three years back. Can I take like one day a week just to play with it? And we said, yep, fine. We had no idea if it's applicable to Saxo is going to make money or anything. Then after one year, he wheels it out of the garage and he gives the demo to me and Kim, Kim being our CEO. And we said, wow, this is awesome. And uh, then we assigned a business development person uh, to Tim. And really, we found there are many use cases for that. And, uh, and uh, it's about uh, collaboration uh, because we are offices in multiple countries. We have clients all over the globe. How can we collaborate using virtual reality better? How can we visualize data better? Um, uh, and um, so the, the aspects of collaboration and visualization, which we thought um, um, are extremely useful and, and can take our customer experience, which is what, what it's all about, to another level. So Kim said, fine, we'll fund it. And uh, also off we go. And then, you know, we put a business development person, we give him uh, uh, money for the hardware and so on. And that went off and running in its own way. So, so these, uh, these things, yeah. yeah. So, so I'll jump in and just, and just do a little bit of a summary on some of this, which is, you know, it sounds like it used to be that the currency, so to speak, of innovation even five years ago was the number of ideas generated or hackathon, winning a hackathon within your company and getting 5,000 US dollars, right? But it sounds like the currency today, based on this example, Ashok, is different, that the currency is actually business results that can scale. And having a bar like that is very different from when I was first looking at innovation, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, General Motors or whatever, when you know, we, would have, we would have these hackathons and the ideas or open innovation. So the currency and the bar being raised to this type of situation where you know, you've got a product that started off as a passionate dream inside of the soul of someone's you know, body, you know, person that worked with you, you, as you mentioned, the psychological safety and permission from senior leadership to agree that that was worth pursuing as a sort of sideline. But then it turned into a full-blown line of business because of the infrastructure. And to me, that's a really important rubric for people to understand in today's market that it's not enough to have the currency be good idea, that taking it across the finish line we call it innovation you can take to the bank, um, or maybe the non-traditional bank in your case, um, is you know, is really the way that it's measured. What are your, what are your thoughts uh, about that, Ashok? Absolutely. Like, I think if you, if you keep, in a, you know, the one thing we, we always ask for is, and Natasha said it in a different word, is the first question we ask is, what are we solving for? So uh, in terms of a purpose, right, in terms of democratizing trading and investment, it's always how can we make the life of a customer better? And that could be in many ways. It could be more insights, more data, use all kinds of technologies out there, but, um, uh, and being digital. So uh, any kind of innovation, for example, if it's not major disruptive business model innovation, but smaller innovation, somebody in ops or marketing, or different way to mine for clients, but it really helps either the client or if from an operational perspective, if it helps make things better, that means it really the cost of de delivering, the cost of a trade reduces because if you digitize something, make something more efficient, you can scale, you can do stuff at a lower cost while solving a problem and you can pass off the cost to a customer. And I'm, and, and I'm going from here to there but, but really, it's, in the end, how does it add value to somebody's life, right? And, that's, and um, if you think along those lines, um, uh, you know, uh, that's really what it's all about. So I, once again, I have five follow-up questions. There's a question that came in about how you deal with the regulatory. I, I'm not sure we're going to get to all of these. Um, there's a, 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 a statement that you just made, though, that I'd love to follow up on, which is that you are literally changing the tires as the car is going down the highway. You know, you are literally um, operationalizing yeah. a very innovative model while you're also allowing the passions of individuals to be folded in as an ingredient in this whole blend. Um, I'm very curious how you view this notion of the role of leadership in that kind of really dynamic environment, complex, 
regulated, looking at, you know, improving the life of customers, which of course is always changing. Sean and I would always insert, you know, not just the customers today, but this notion of future proofing, which is what's on the horizon where we can be anticipating the future and also this notion of having a perspective about the future. It sounds like your philosophy of democratizing these, these transactions is a huge purpose. So, you know, what, what, what kind of leaders do you hire or, or, or cultivate within Saxo Bank to manage all of the, this innovation? Right. I think uh, we need people with the learning mindset uh, uh, who are curious, as again, pointed to what Natasha said, is who are really curious, have a learning mindset, and more importantly, people could have good ideas, but the they, 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 but they may not have the willingness to change, right? So mm -hmm. being, having a mindset that, okay, you know, this is something new. I haven't done this before. I haven't tried this before, but I'm going to try this, right? And so having that mindset with, uh, without saying, oh my God, this is too risky and uh, this might be career threatening. I'm not even going to bring up the idea. You're going to let all that go, right? You really, really uh, got to be ambitious in terms of uh, what you can do. And, you know, the new products, new markets, new tech, and you, you've got to have your radar on all the time to see, okay, how can I use this piece of information or this piece of technology or this way of doing things to make uh, our company better, our products better, or the life, and eventually the lives of a customer better. So curiosity, learning mindset, and a bit of resiliency. And if you're a leader, give people in your team uh, the psychological safety to bring these ideas to the table and give them some money and room to try it out. And if it fails, hey, sorry, bad idea, let's move on. Yeah, so let's go to the next slide, Sean, because I think what we'd like to do, although I, you know, I'd love to spend another hour on this, I find the example of Saxo Bank so compelling and having so many core insights about the way that we need to think about innovation these days. Um, we've talked about the behind the scenes look in terms of the VR um, and, and that, you know, the, the way that a product actually went. We just talked about, you know, who gets to lead. I wonder if you have any pet peeves. <laughs> and, and we won't be offended if some of the pet peeves are about things that we, Sean and Natasha and I have talked about. You know, are there any pet peeves around, you know, people having these kinds of conversation about innovation? Pet peeves, I think uh, when it comes to innovation, right, and uh, many, uh, there are many many, many good ideas. And then when it comes to execution, sometimes what happens, regulation is an issue. It, it's a really great idea, but um, uh, we have to take the regulators through the journey. Oh, you know what? This is, this is really good, uh, good for the customer. And, it's, you know, it, uh, and we are not out there taking customers' data, this, that, the other thing. So the regulators seem to be always one or two steps behind. And... Uh, and, uh, you know, it is what it is, and we have to deal with it. Um, and uh, especially if there was some massive, uh, I don't know, problem out there, data breach something, then the regulators get even more worried and more conservative, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Well, I think it's a great time for us to go to period three. So keep live on this, Ashok. Um, this is a good yep. translation, uh, transition into the roundtable. Um, first of all, I saw Natasha raising, uh, shaking her head, nodding her head, et cetera. I was wondering if, Natasha, if you had a follow-up comment or questions, um, you know, so that you and Ashok could talk about something as people in the field experiencing this today. Natasha, any thoughts? I loved what Ashok said about fast fail, like go in, give it a shot and then move on if it doesn't work. Um, and that in terms of psychological safety, that's a huge thing because a lot of people won't put forward ideas at all because they're afraid not only will they get shot down, but it will be a black mark on their career. Or they'll get fired Correct. or you wasted money or you did something. And, and that's not necessarily, that, that's not even necessarily true, much less the thinking, but there's this fear of failure and negative self-talk that, you know, drives people to not want to do that. So Ashok, when you said that, that really resonated with me because I think that's something that pops up on a regular basis for sure. So I would yeah. say, let's keep this going. Hang on one second. Let's go to the polling question so we can get the last people to vote um, as we're having our final uh, conversation. Okay, so Ashok, what, what are your thoughts about uh, what Natasha just said? No, I, look, it's absolutely because 
Right. Innovation is not just one or two or or a handful of people who happen to be smarter than everyone. I just believe that in 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 in, in generally in any corporate environment uh, or any environment, people are generally smart. People are educated. They read. They watch TV, and they do have uh, good ideas. And uh, uh, and if taking ideas to execution depends upon financial backing, and in a corporate environment, the corporates really giving them. uh both emotional mm-hmm. financial and uh, support to really try out uh, some of these ideas if they believe in it and of course if somebody comes up with an idea they got to take the trouble to actually make the business case of why what problem this is going to solve and how is it going to make somebody's life better but uh but that's yeah, great that's my- So we're going to do a a rapid uh, fire with the questions that were submitted in advance. Thank you very much to the folks that did this. Uh, This is from uh, Amit Tipnis from Amazon. How do you incorporate innovation into your next year's roadmap? So let's start with Ashok and then we'll go to Natasha. I think you set up aside uh, at least a bit of money and call it a foundation budget and uh, whereas uh it's a part of money so if somebody comes up with an idea uh, but they but they need resources to actually follow through uh, then then uh, you know you have a little bit of money set aside to uh, to try something out and quick question follow up to that um earlier we heard about portfolio being extremely important in the polling question so when you look at the portfolio for 2020 say um is there an innovation uh element within the portfolio planning or is it sort of like on another spreadsheet altogether no i don't think we have at least for us uh, innovation is uh, i can say everything we do you know innovation is not just one person job or one department job or a portfolio or a project like everybody has uh, has the freedom uh, to come up with uh, innovative ideas uh, either uh, at an operational level or if they say hey you know what uh we can monitor we are building this product we can take the small piece and monetize that um that that can be a product we can offer to a white label customer so everybody has the license to come forward with creative ideas so it's not one particular project or portfolio great well, everybody throw, has a license in a way i'll throw the next question to did not use the same question but the next question to natasha which is Why do you think most innovation projects fail? We talked about fail fast and you know out in Silicon Valley there's so much lean startup conversation and like failing fast and then the large companies are like we're not startups, you know, we we can't afford to fail at all. Yeah. How do you think I, they I, fail? Yeah, I think it's it's a, a combination of things. So, you know, I think the, when you get a person who's just really good at say telling a story or a person who's really customer facing but doesn't know how to build a business case i think you know it it starts with the idea and then it it comes to like the ability to tell a story and, and make it convincing but then also show the financial benefits and how it ultimately impacts the customers at the end of the day um i i just don't think and you know i might be kind of bias and this is probably the reason why not everyone i don't believe everyone is cut out for innovation necessarily it is the follow through on all the parts you don't know how to do and resourcing and figuring out how you pull from your organization to um help you build that story and build that community around you know bringing a full idea or an innovation to the market um if you you know if you don't do that i think you could just kind of lose interest and move on to something else so i'll give the the final question to ashok which is um who leads is a really important question right and also for a longer conversation what does leadership look like in today's world but um what execution models are important so there's as as natasha just said there's kind of the inception of the idea some people call it like you know the 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 back end of innovation that that where you have to actually make it work um you know what's what's what have you observed ashok in this last question um about the models that work um for it to really thrive within an organization look i can just talk from the example out here um uh, is well i have two examples where, where i'm working now and one of the past companies i worked with and each has this in our company we are 15 1500 people really in the end the ceo blesses uh, a major innovation a major parts we have to take to the market major way we approach it people we partner with and uh, of course he is not into the details he's not a marketing expert necessarily or a tech expert um and the ideas could have come from someone in the organization or 
from the for somewhere but in the end we you know the ceo has to bless this that it makes business sense right to to pursue something and in terms of execution models again the devil there are many 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 great ideas but the devil is in the details right so um you need people who are structured who can think through uh, okay what are the challenges to execution what, what tools do you use how do you market it how do you sell it i mean the whole business case and go to market strategy which needs to be thought through but you may not need to have all the answers you can try maybe one quick sprint a minimum viable product uh, do something and then go from there uh, because initially you don't want to spend millions of dollars on an idea which may or may not work so what is the minimum viable product you can try out or something you you have to have well defined so brilliant i will um ask natasha and ashok to just go on mute again you've been amazing um before you go on mute any any last words natasha thank you so much i mean this is fun i love to get into these conversations and talk about you know what's going on in the industry and how to think differently about it ashok i really love doing this with you yeah great so you can yeah, go like on mute ashok any any last words no no look it's really interesting because everybody is thinking about this topic of innovation everybody is thinking okay how do you make it work how do you fund it how do you get ideas to execution and um, this is a seriously important topic because otherwise we'll all just become dinosaurs uh, and we we got to move forward in life so perfect that's that's a great that's a great last one so you could go on mute but stay on because we'll we'll close out now i'll say one thing about the poll this is the first time that i've experienced in an innovation poll that data is winning out over creativity 71% of people when talked about which is more important to our innovation efforts this year um data is more important and i think that's quite interesting i'm hoping it's not that i said bad things about milan and design <laughs> thinking um i love both the city and the people who do design thinking um but i do think it's interesting because data especially within corporate growth you know at the end of the day when we were talking about what's the currency what's the metric um data is where we all live and so how can we together figure out what's the right data that we should be sharing to get ahead of the future so now i'll go and mute uh and now back to you Sean to close us out well our audience in italy has gone to the floor given all your insights <laughs> so land and uh, the fashion wearing uh innovationistas but uh Uh, and by the way CIOs and CIMOs probably the toughest relationship in any company i think 10 years down the road somehow our two special panelists they are going to work with each other because they seem to get along with each other strangely enough so um well done and thank you for all the great insights uh one minute uh we'll close this out in 1 minute uh because we all operate on the hour business cycle we have three webinars coming up you should join us we'll have similar types of discussion with more revelation and learning and entertainment so you can find out where those are online um we've already covered off the questions we've had our q and a all of these webcasts uh reside at futureproofingnext.com/futureproofingnow uh we do this stuff in our regular day jobs too so we can help your company discover pivot build lead um yeah we're nice people please give us a shout um and then finally this is how you can connect with us uh we've provided the linkedin profiles of our panelists today but i'm sure uh they wouldn't mind if uh, any of you uh had some follow up questions for them and we will be posting this episode tomorrow uh online so uh, i look forward to our next discussion i want to thank our panelists and my co-host andrea today and we look forward to seeing you all in the near future <laughs>